Hey you guys, it's me, Media Gito. Welcome back to Southwest Studios and the show. And you've seen the picture, you've checked the title. We are continuing Elliot Smith in the audiobook Torment Saint by William Todd Schultz, read and commented on by yours truly, Media Gito. Obviously I do a lot of jumping all over the place and that's uh, one thing about being a gymnast. That's a... That's a joke there. Um, that's one thing about being a renaissance man. A creative mind is I'm interested in a bunch of shit. Not enough time to get back. Um, but I have completed a couple things. The Kurt Cobain, Love and Death, The Murder of Kurt Cobain book by uh, Wallace and Halperin continues to reverberate daily. And for me, you know, getting a couple hits, a couple comments on a project every day is cool. It goes to show what is echoing. Well, what is echoing? Stuff about rock stars, very talented musicians, who the media has told us have killed themselves. I believe that Elliot Smith killed himself, so that is not at all why I'm reading Torment Saint. I do think there's a small chance Jennifer Chiba stabbed him and stuff, but I think the truth of it is that Elliot... He went from taking a bunch of psychiatric drugs and stuff um, and all sorts of illegal drugs to nothing. He cold turkey everything, and as a result, he couldn't handle it. That's why doctors advise against that kind of thing, you know, um, strongly. But we'll get to that point towards the end of the book. Um, I had a great time having Sam Weiss on the show. Sam is a very good friend of mine, known him for a very long time. And it kind of occurred to us, hey, why don't we try out Skype or Google Hangouts and try to record a movie review? And the reason that I had been hesitant to do so for a long time is just because of the technology. I've had podcasts before where I'll you know, talk with a co-host in person, <clears throat> and it's tons of fun. It's a lot easier, as you can imagine, than doing the old over the Atlantic Ocean. No, I've got World War II on the brain right now, uh, because I am listening to The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich by William L. Shirer, who apparently was there at the time. I don't know if he was a German reporter. I need to look him up, but so fascinating, and a little teaser hint, that may play into the next movie that Sam Weiss and I review here on Southwest Studios, uh, hopefully this weekend. So I won't tell you what movie it is, but it is fucking amazing. Now, I hate intros, you hate intros, get to the point. I agree, I'm doing what I said I hated. Anytime I go look up a subject, I've got to skip to where you're at right now, about the four minute mark, before I actually get to the content. I like to think you listen to my channel because it's a certain voice, uh, or two voices, you know. Sam might not be the only guest on, um... So, and in fact, if you feel you have something, a lot to say, and you're interesting, you can leave a comment. But I'm not hurting for guests, and I don't think you and I will get along. It takes a long time and a lot of conversation to get to the place where someone like Sam and I are at. And Sam's a fucking crazy motherfucker. Alright? He is like the Joker. He just wants to see the world burn. So he didn't particularly care when Danny and Christian were getting their shit pushed in on uh, Norwegian Island in midsummer. He said, you know, some people need to have their lives fucked up. And that's his, uh, that's his perspective. He's chaotic. You know, you got to respect a man like that. Sam, if you gave him $50 million, he would just burn it. (laughs) All right, so Torment Saint by William Todd Schultz. As we get back into, you know, winter's coming around. I know we just started autumn and fall. Since since I've been rambling, might as well keep doing it. Winter is coming. Game of Thrones is over and disappointing, so I mean it in the most literal sense. Winter is nearing. I guess we need to change 
the phrase because that show is like a black mark on our collective soul, which is also a great band. Winter is nearing, <laughs> and so we need to get warm um, by reinvesting in someone we care about like Elliot Smith. And Media Gita, are you obsessed with dead rock stars? Yes. Actually, I'm not. So here's here's how it is. I feel like there's only been a few greats in the 20th century, and it goes like this. Bob Dylan. John Lennon, Paul McCartney. Kurt Cobain. Elliot Smith. The end. And you can argue for all sorts of people, and I... As Jim Briggs would say, stop typing. Okay, you need to check out The World According to Briggs. It's a great <clears throat> travel show. Uh, he reviews cities in the U.S. Stop typing. <laughs> um, because I can see your comments about how Jeff Tweedy and David Bowie and how could you leave off. I get it. There's been some good songwriters. Tom Waits, man. Um, Robbie Robertson, what are you talking about? Jimi Hendrix, I agree on all these points. We're talking Da Vinci-level musical artists who changed the game. There's like four. I defy you. And lest you think that I am obsessed with the dead rock stars because three out of the, well, three out of the five of those people are dead. Bob Dylan and Paul McCartney are still alive. I'm not even a huge Beatles fan. I'm really not. But I can recognize that they completely changed pop music and uh, really the album as well. And of course, you can argue, oh, the Beatles copied so-and-so for Rubber Soul. Yeah, but they're the first to go mainstream. Oftentimes, that's all that matters. You know, it's the difference between Facebook and whatever the Winklevi were doing. So I say all that to say this, as the black men like to say. Elliot Smith is in that four. He's in that top four. And so he's the last great artist musically that we had. Um, and that's it. That's it. Chapter 7, Robot Hand. Page 234. The intervention's failure was not, obviously, a hopeful sign. Had he stuck with it, had he found some way of overlooking the deadening tedium of the inpatient routine, had he come to see the depression, the suicidal thinking, the drinking as a trio of enemies, the attitude might have saved Elliot. What it seems to come down to, for most people in a similar predicament, is a commitment to placing supreme value on one's life and regarding all anti-life forces as egodystonic in clinical terms, in other words, not me. Psychologically, the failure suggested a refusal to relinquish devices that weren't working. Or, from a different angle, they were working, they were effective, but they guaranteed a larger, deeper, long-term failure. There was the alcohol. There was the longing for non-being, that fantasized escape from chronic feelings of worthlessness. But more important, there was the depression, Kierkegaard's faithful mistress, which, as Gonson had said, Eliot was in love with. He had a hard time imagining life without it, and he'd come to connect it with his creativity. Far from seeing it as an enemy, he clung to it as indispensable. He was a ghostwriter, he said, for an ocean in a shell from a poison well. It was the poison he dipped into. What remained when the poison was gone? He knew the poison, what he didn't know was what life might feel like without it. Fans, too, wanted the sad song symphony. The sadness was the act. They came to feel it, to mutely observe, to find themselves vicariously redeemed, just like Kafka's hunger artists groupies. They weren't there for new songs or happy songs. They wanted Elliot to go down. They were there for the torment saint. It was his job to deliver them from evil, to share his vulnerability genius. 
The intervention had another negative side effect. In its aftermath, different long-term friendships began eroding slightly. It was difficult to stick by a person with so little interest in self-preservation. There was scant faith he'd get any better. He'd asked in songs why anyone kept faith with this disaster. Friends started wondering the same thing. Most stuck it out, but with a building feeling of hopelessness and dread. Happy endings were hard to visualize. So after leaving Arizona, bailing out on Sierra Tucson, and dropping back down almost magically on Dorian's couch, Elliot's existence got even more peripatetic, not unlike the days in Portland when he lived unofficially at JJ's while he kept a room in the Heatmiser house. His habit, in fact, had always been to keep spaces as he relocated. He was usually spread out all over in a state of metaphysical homelessness. Eventually, the arrangement with Dorian came to a natural end. The entire time he was there, he kept insisting he needed to find his own place soon. He was hyper-aware he was in somebody's space, Dorian says. And although her two male roommates really liked him in the beginning, after many months, they were like, how long is he staying? One roommate was a merch guy, on tour a lot. So that bought Elliot more time. Still, it was not a setup built to last. At one point, then, he moved to Park Slope in Brooklyn, to a flat including his own room, something he did not have at Gary's, with a very sweet couple, Shauna and Pierre, who were friends with Ellen Stewart. Who were friends with Ellen Stewart. Soon the couple moved to a different apartment in Park Slope, and Elliot tagged along. Later, he'd also lived for a time with artist and college friend Mark Swanson, and with a woman, Jackie Ferry, whom no one knew well, but had some sort of job in the music industry, according to Friends of Elliot's. So I'm just going to cut in here. Jackie Ferry. Jackie Ferry went on to be the nanny for Kurt and Courtney and Francis Bean. Um... She is the one that can be seen in Montage of Heck, kind of tending to Francis Bean while Kurt is nodding out and Courtney's saying, you shouldn't be like this. So as the text says, with a woman, Jackie Ferry, whom no one knew well, but had some sort of job in the music industry. Okay, we're going to keep our eye on Jackie Ferry here. In New York, Elliot's sister, Ashley, re-entered his life on a semi-regular basis, although there had never been any real estrangement to speak of. She'd started college at University of Southern California, so she was on the other side of the country. But they made a mutual promise to be together on Thanksgiving. It was their special holiday. She would travel to wherever he was to spend the week with him, wherever he happened to wind up on the holiday, Park Slope, Jersey City, or Hoboken. For the first time, she got to know his newer friends, including Dorian and others. He opened up this whole new world to me, she says. I was pretty rigid and math-minded. That was the subject she studied in college. Although later she also developed a strong interest in primate, specifically chimpanzee research. I had blinders on, she adds. It was an awakening for me. He was totally different than all my friends and how I'd grown up. He was open-minded and really compassionate. Just the open-mindedness and the artistic side, his activist mentality, his fairness, he totally turned that on in me. The meals put together always made for happy, positive, festive occasions, everyone chipping in with entrees or side dishes. Often the combination of people present was slapdash, more or less accidental. Once Elliot was in charge of carving the turkey, which they'd named Tom, on another occasion, the turkey seemed to be undercooked. Everyone started panicking, calling mothers for advice. So it took hours, Ashley says. There was me, his little sister, like a dork, visiting from California, but I had such a blast. After finally getting the turkey figured out, essentially slow cooking it, Ashley, Elliot, and Kazu Makino from Blonde Redhead took off for the video store, at last deciding on Austin Powers. Ashley recalls, We got back and put in the movie, and within half an hour, all of us were just like snoring asleep. 
Ashley and Elliot also toured the art museums, despite the fact that Bunny, the average concerned mom, kept telling her, Be careful in New York! Venturing out, even to museums, was apparently some slight cause for concern. It was actually more pleasant than usual to be there with her brother. Outside New York, he'd get stared at a lot. He'd look kind of grimy and, you know, well, unkempt. Store personnel targeted him for a thief sometimes. But in New York, Ashley says, he was just another guy. He said he never felt scared in New York because if you walk around and you look like you don't have anything, no one bothers you. In the museums, his knowledge of art and artists, their culture, the period, their place in art history, astounded her. He read a huge amount, she says, and as they looked at various paintings, he provided a kind of running tutorial. Once he gave her a Rothko book. An interesting choice, since like Elliot, Rothko also attended Lincoln High School in Portland, as had poet Gary Snyder and Simpsons creator Matt Groening. The two of them did their share of dumb and goofy things, too. In bars, Elliot liked to play Ms. Pac-Man, for instance. He was so good, Ashley remembers. He looked up the highest scores online one time, and his score was way higher than the highest-scoring Ms. Pac-Man champion. (laughs) This is Media G-Tow saying, God bless you, Elliot. Having Ashley back around, involved in his life, watching out for him as best she could was a major gain for Elliot. She was someone to trust implicitly. He knew he could turn to her. He knew she loved him enormously and wanted the best for him always. She was a little sister first and foremost, so his relationship with her had always been similar to the one he'd formed with Dorian, also several years younger. But more and more, she'd also assumed the role of default caregiver, especially after the New York years ended and Elliot moved to L.A., where Ashley would also eventually live in order to provide much-needed support. She had not been present at the intervention, according to Gary, but she knew of it, and she was keenly aware of the nature and the depth of his struggles. It was, despite Elliot's travails, a hugely exciting time. Goodwill Hunting premiered in Westwood on December 2nd, 1997, then played again two days later in New York, a screening Elliot attended along with Gary and others. Wide release of the film occurred January 9th, 1998. The lead-up to Oscar night included numerous performances, some low-key, some high-profile. Elliot played Largo twice in L.A. with John Bryan sitting in. This was a collaboration that would deepen over the years, yet end unhappily. He also played Spaceland in Silver Lake, a gig including the first live performance of the J.J. Gonson-inspired song Pizzola, with its gorgeously tasteful dancing piano interlude trailing the line, No one deserves this. It wasn't the first time, nor the last, that Elliot employed piano brilliantly as embellishment, a stately guest in songs consisting mostly of finger-picked acoustic guitar. On March 4, 1998, Elliot appeared on Conan O'Brien. He would not be allowed to sit down for the Oscars, but this night he did, in a t-shirt emblazoned with the state of Texas, a rich symbol if ever there was one, and a light blue stocking cap that would become, over the next several months, a trademark accent. Sounding a little hoarser than usual, he sang the expected tune, Miss Misery. It is a soulful performance with little traces of nerves. At the song's conclusion, the audience erupts spontaneously, Elliot's softness and subtlety having apparently won them over, as it tended to do in the small clubs, where he had that ability to render everyone instantly, expectantly silent. It's easy to see his coiled power. The next day it was MTV Live with Carson Daly, in a glass studio over Times Square. Here it was pure showbiz glibness in the face of raw authenticity, the chasm between the two widening as a prefatory interview proceeds, although Elliot clearly does his best to sound polite and appreciative. He wears the same outfit as the night before. 
an attempt by handlers, no doubt, to present a consistent indie image. Daly begins oddly, asking Elliot, You feeling all right? A strange question to put to a star supposed to be born all right, always at the ready. Most likely Daly sensed nervousness, and Elliot definitely appears uptight, his eye contact sporadic at best. Immediately, Daly asks about the Ferdinand tattoo, which Elliot obligingly and revealingly interprets as a bull who doesn't want to go to the bullfight, but he does. A clear reference to his present situation. That's awesome, Daly replies, Daly replies lamely. Later, Elliot can be heard to say softly, whoops, as his fidgeting leads him to slide off the stool he's sitting on. The interview gives way to yet another performance of Miss Misery. There's brief discussion of Elliot recording with an 80-piece orchestra alongside, De- alongside Danny Elfman, who scored the film. The song then was Between the Bars, and Elliot recalls the experience as really fun. It was done live, and the whole thing took only about five minutes, he says. It was really easy. Okay. This is MG. We're going to pause because in case you can't tell, I suck. Sometimes it's good to just call out the elephant in the room, which is that I'm stuttering a bit or who knows what, but it's always always a good time to stop and look at what we're seeing. You know? I mean, he's being, yeah, nominated for a Grammy. Or sorry, an Oscar. MG, are you even paying attention to the shit you're reading? Clearly not. Now, to be fair, it's it's easy to see how I could confuse those, right? It's he's being nominated for Oscar for uh, best song, not a Grammy. Okay, page two thirty eight. Perhaps the biggest change of all to Elliot's life, coming out of the suddenly oversized attention, had to do with his label situation. There had arisen, as Barney Hoskins put it in a radio interview with Elliot, a potentially fairy tale development. Elliot transitioned from Kill Rock Stars to the impossibly gaudy DreamWorks, developed in 1994 by Steven Spielberg, Jeffrey Katzenberg, and David Geffen. DreamWorks Records were the music arm of the Enterprise, its initial project, George Michael's older album. The first band signed was Eels who recorded Beautiful Freak under the imprint in 1997. Elliot's take on the switch was circumspect, omitting deeper specifics relating to Slim Moon and the deterioration of that relationship in the wake of the intervention just months before. I was happy on Kill Rock Stars, Elliot tells Hoskins, but I couldn't stay. I sort of had to be on a major label because of contractual things. In other words, someone with the necessary resources needed to buy him out of the old virgin deal he'd signed years back as a member of Heat Miser. But he'd already been recording with Kill Rock Stars. He could have chosen to stay on, or he could simply have spoken with Virgin about his desire to end their relationship. Instead, he took a different tack, succumbing to the interest DreamWorks had been expressing even before the big Oscars-driven push. As he explained, the deal had been getting wrapped up when the Oscars came along. He was not signed because of the Oscars. The move was in motion months prior. At any rate, whatever exactly went down, whatever convoluted financial and contractual chaos needed sorting out, Elliot was, at least initially, happy in his new home. I like DreamWorks, he said simply. They are very nice. For one thing, they didn't seem particularly concerned with generating hits. He didn't feel as if he were getting groomed for some sort of improbable stardom. Also, for the very first time, he had mind-bending resources at his disposal. Now he'd record in a real studio, with no limit on the number of tracks available. The days of forced austerity, byproducts of make-do recording sessions in friends' homes or basements were over forever. Anything was possible. And as Elliot explained, this opened up his process. 
he could try any and all instruments, even the vibes his grandfather played, to see what worked and what didn't. For me, he said, it's always better to try the most preposterous thing because, who knows, happy accident. It all might sound more polished, or maybe not, maybe much the same as before. But the possibilities were endless. Strings, perhaps, piano for sure, even suspended orchestral bass drums. As he'd slept those months on Dorian's floor and stayed home alone all day while everyone else went to work, sometimes drinking, sometimes not, he wrote songs continuously, his usual method of unconscious noodling. Many new tunes already existent in at least nascent form. In the studio environment made possible by DreamWorks, they'd take on texture. As expected, DreamWorks wanted a video. Elliot was, of course, no stranger to the medium. He'd done Coming Up Roses, as well as the small number of Heat Miser videos. And as far back as October 1996, he'd worked with independent filmmaker Jim Cohen on Lucky Three. For that, a roughly 12-minute film featuring three complete songs won a cover, 13, which Cohen had specifically suggested. It was just Jim and Elliot, no crew. The two sought out locations in Portland, important to Elliot, several near Gonson's undercover studio workspace. Cohen recalls the three-day process as simple and pleasant, never difficult, never convoluted, or in any way troubled. He had very little in the way of resources, but somehow, despite that fact, the project came together fabulously. The entire enterprise was adamantly independent. Then the idea had been simply to depict a musician doing what he naturally did in an unpretentious, unmediated way. Lucky 3 was decidedly not a video project, not a label-sponsored or label-driven product, but more a reaction against music videos with their often formulaic artificiality. Lucky Three was the result of a one-time-only partnership. So this time Elliot wound up working with Ross Spears again, who told him his preference was to not intersperse shots from Goodwill Hunting, which in the entertainment industry is close to impossible, Spears maintained. But Elliot agreed, and that was that, Spears said. I thought... Immediately, people from DreamWorks and from Goodwill Hunting checked out Spears' other Elliot videos and found them to be pretty lo-fi. What they wanted, predictably, was more production value, more gloss, and sheen. Spears' response was that if they gave us some decent money, it would look good and everyone would be happy. They did not, however, go for the notion of omitting clips. That idea was shot down, and according to Spears, Elliot didn't really mind. The movie's producer told Spears to go out and watch the film, which he did on a midnight showing he somehow managed to walk into for free. As he returned the next morning, the same producer had a TV set up in his office. He began to play the film, but Spears stopped him, saying, I saw it just a few hours ago in a theater. Sure he did, the producer replied and walked out, leaving Spears with the feeling he was back in high school in the principal's office. They talked later about which segments of the movie might be usable. Spears felt the romantic scenes between Matt Damon and Minnie Driver could work, but he wasn't so sure about the stuff with Robin Williams because he's always hugging Matt Damon and stuff, and that might come out a bit homoerotic. It was mostly a joke, Spears aside, but sure enough, no clips of Damon and Williams were made available in the editing room. From the outdoor shoot, excuse me, for the outdoor shoot that followed Elliot as he walked through a Silver Lake neighborhood in sunglasses, in his white suit with pink carnation, Spears recalls him in good spirits, his confidence pretty high on the heels of the nomination. A motorcycle cop happened to be on set controlling traffic. He looked so typically cop that Spears and Elliot both started laughing. On the spot, they decided to put him in the chute. The idea initially was to have him follow Elliot down the sidewalk on his bike. He said that was impossible, to do so would be illegal. So the motorcycle was set aside, but the cops stalked Elliot on foot, still wearing his shades and helmet. 
I would tell Elliot to look over his shoulder from time to time, which he did, with decent acting chops. Spears said, he nailed that look of annoyance and paranoia, maybe from experience. It's true. Cops unnerved him. And though in the video the lurking policeman comes off as comically feckless, watching bemusedly as Elliot sticks coins in expired parking meters, in reality the paranoia was all too real. As he told an interviewer for Much Music, his habit was to steer clear of authorities at all times and to deliberately try not doing anything to draw their attention. Also, years later, toward the end of his life, in fact, the fear of being followed would reach extreme proportions. It wasn't anything to laugh about. Other shots put Elliot at a bus stop with backup singers mouthing, Ah, along with close-ups in the doorway of the Smog Cutter, a famous L.A. dive bar. In editing, Spears was ambushed. Another editor had done his own cut, full of fast edits and much jumping back and forth between locations, the kind of ADHD aesthetic that prevailed at the time. He said he didn't like it. The second editor asked where they ought to start then. Spears answered, by erasing everything. In the end, two edits were made, one with film clips and one, a director's version, without. Both can be seen online at YouTube. But before finishing up, Spears was mount excuse me. But before finishing up, Spears was made to contend with tedious, self canceling lists of notes from Goodwill Hunting People, Capitol Records, which put out the soundtrack, DreamWorks People, Elliot's management, and so on. His response was that he was only taking Elliot's suggestions, and that pretty much ended that. Elliot himself was not totally pleased. He didn't like the super close-ups. I told him he was a handsome stud and to just deal with it, Spears recalls. <clears throat> to Spears, who had worked with Elliot closely on several very different projects and over several very different vibes of years, from anonymity to relative fame, he was a real down-to-earth person who liked, very dryly and with no tip-off flavor of sarcasm, to poke fun at pretentious behavior of every stripe. There would always be absurd incongruities. He'd be recording in an expansive in an expensive studio, then slip outside for a spastic skateboard session, everyone wearing wigs all day. Once Elliot stayed with Spears at a time when Spears' neighbor was living behind a big bush. Apparently his parents had insisted he move out. He did, but only so far as the front yard. Later, Spears ran into Elliot, who told him to say hi to his family, and also to the guy who lives in the bush. For Spears, the remark epitomized Elliot's brand of humor. He would say things without a hint of irony. Such remarks were often outrageously funny, yet no one could explain exactly why. <laughs> Well, this is me again, uh, cutting in. Yeah, I think it's that same, <laughs> that same becoming a Ms. Pac-Man champion. I don't know why that struck me as so funny, but to be the best at Ms. Pac-Man is very specific and a little queer. And uh, it seems like Elliot, you know, it, people like Elliot, it feels like we know them. And it's not just because their music is great. It's because they were cool. I think cool isn't being mean, it's being funny. All right, let's get back to the text. Page 242. The scrutiny of press wouldn't alter Elliot's more entrenched and charming tendencies. He felt... Pretty much the same, he said, which was both good and bad, in that I think a lot about the same things. At the time, he was working his way through Proust's remembrance of things past, a few pages at a time. Before that, he'd taken on Beckett's fictional trilogy, Malloy, Malone Dies, and The Unnameable. 
These were minimalist tales of vagrancy, death, inertia, and institutionalization made up, in some instances, of lengthy inner monologues. No doubt they spoke to Eliot's sense of dread and of ennui. Ennui. <laughs> it is ennui. At the same time, he did admit some differences in his life and world, mainly because there's quite a fuss made over people who are on TV for some reason, adding, Personally, I watch TV with the sound off. I gotta cut in. That, again, you know, I don't worship anybody or... But this is why we, I like Elliot. You know, personally... It, there's quite a fuss made over people who are on TV for some reason, he says. Personally, I watch TV with the sound off. I don't know. I just think it's pretty... I mean, obviously, he doesn't take himself too seriously, which I've encouraged you guys and myself not to do. Um, and it's very easy to take yourself seriously when you're becoming a star and everyone's saying you're a big deal. And not only that, there's a lot of false talent. There's a lot of whatever, Justin Bieber's or things that are, you know, popular and they suck. It just sounds like auto-tune shit. But then occasionally you get your great artists who are, <clears throat> they are very talented, have great music, and they're extremely popular. You know, Nirvana was one of those bands. Elliot, at this time, coming into the later 90s, was becoming one of those artists that if you were in the know, and I wasn't, I was uh, still a teenager at this time, but if you were in the know and you were kind of in the New York area at this time, um, no, I probably watched the Oscars that year, and I don't know if I saw Goodwill Hunting in the theaters, to be honest with you, but I was aware, and it was cool, um, but I don't know that Elliot Smith registered for me. You just hear this kind of mopey song, and it's great, but it, it doesn't really hint at the genius that he is and was if you just took him from that time frame of uh what did they say the movie came out in january of 98 on wider release um it must have just been in time to qualify for the oscars they said december 2nd 97 in any case why am i even interjecting here what's my point well what is my point it must have been a very exciting time if you knew elliot um and the one thing that really not the one thing but one thing that really stands out to me about Elliot, that everyone has copied since and no one has achieved the same effect, is what Schultz alludes to here, how he could make a room just shut up. The ability to make everyone listen to you. Um, and you can hear a pin drop. Because what you're delivering is kind of undeniable. It's the word I always go back to. I want you guys to be undeniable with whatever it is. You could be undeniably good to your family or good at fucking running or good at fucking for all I care. No, that's not really a good way to invest your time. But be undeniable in something where they can't say, yeah, he's a bad dad. It's like, really? Do you want to talk to my kids? I think they'll tell you something different. Or whatever. Be undeniable in some aspect of your life. Now, I don't do these videos as some kind of coach or motivational. But I do live by certain rules and recurring themes that tend to come back that I feel might as well share that some of these messages with you. Um, what are you undeniable in that's positive? Don't be an undeniably great alcoholic. I'm not sure you could feel so proud of that. <clears throat> My point being that Elliot was undeniably a great musician at this time, and that feeling to be on top of your game and crushing it, playing at the Oscars. And I think they'll go into Celine Dion later. I'm surprised that we kind of skimmed this because I remember... Oh, no, we're, we're getting into it. Okay. If I would just shut up. But how Celine Dion was super cool to him uh, and his whole... You know, you have to remember this was the Titanic year. So what won instead? We know Titanic didn't win. Best picture. Was it Goodwill Hunting? Okay, just shut up, Mini Gito. Fucking know if you just read the fucking text, you dipshit. I, I'm sorry. I gotta get more coffee anyway. See you guys. Be right back.
Okay. I don't know why I did a little gay voice at the end there, too. That was uh, quite inappropriate. Or maybe I'm just gay. But continuing on, page 242. The other challenge, a sort of side effect of the general fuss, the new label and the demands made as industry types sought to capitalize on the potential of the new platform, was that time for making up songs the leisure to settle in and let the sounds emerge, was getting harder and harder to find. It was all about serving the brouhaha. So, despite the fact that, pre-Oscar nomination, Elliot had been steadily at work on handfuls of new tunes, those written in Gary's living room in New York, when time was seemingly endlessly in supply, they lived in a state of incipience. They waited like impatient friends, understanding but eager. Meanwhile, Elliot found himself dealing with the likes of People magazine, which had run a dismissive piece calling him a Beck impersonator for wearing, like Beck did once, a white suit. It was hard for him to ignore such opinion. A new thing to absorb, it tended to bum him out. So he decided self-protectively to stop reading press. It was easier, he figured, than having to deal with the insecurities unkind stories might provoke. In time, the pro and con judgments did at last slow to a trickle. The night came and went, Elliot survived, and he lost to the kind Dion, as expected, the dogs barked and the caravan moved on, in other words, as Truman Capote once put it. Then, with relief, it was back to the music. Many of the new songs he was trying out in various degrees of completion as early as 1997, but others emerged in 1998. Sometimes he'd play them as straight instrumentals before lyrics were written. This was the case for what would be called Waltz Number 1. Others were sung with first-draft lyrics that later would be jettisoned almost entirely. His habit was to ask the crowd whether they wanted to hear an old song or a new song. Usually they would call out some old number, something they knew and loved. But other times a request for something new broke through the din, and then he'd oblige, often apologetically, saying, This one isn't finished yet, but... One regular haunt which he played several times before Oscar night was L.A.'s Largo, a hive of accomplished experimental musicianship and songwriting run like a cabaret. He was there twice in January 1998, then again in late March, four days after the Academy Awards ceremony. The place was bought in 1992 by Mark Flanagan, a burly Belfast native, and his wife Amy. Regular performers included Amy Mann, her husband Michael Penn, Fiona Apple, Ricky Lee Jones, Neil Finn, Mr. E of the Eels, Jacob Dylan, and Ben Folds, among others. But it was known for the regular Friday night residency of savant John Bryan, who championed what he charmingly called unpopular pop. Bryan's father was a band director at Yale, his mother a singer. At 17, he dropped out of school, teaching himself to play several instruments and studying the rudiments of orchestration. At age seven or eight, he recalls an epiphany. He had asked himself, what if I can't spend my life making music? And I remember rationally thinking with no drama, whatever, that I just had to commit suicide if it didn't happen. I've never not known what I was going to do from that moment on. He formed a band, The Bats, which put out an album, How Pop Can You Get, in 1982. Another band, World's Fair, followed but fizzled out quickly. He then toured with Till Tuesday, Amy Mann's new wave outfit, whose song Voices Carry was an MTV staple. He went on from there to produce Mann's first two solo albums, Whatever and I'm With Stupid full of thoughtful, finely crafted, lyrically complex pop. He also worked on Fiona Apple's Extraordinary Machine album and Sean Lennon's Friendly Fire. Lennon compared Brian to Prince. 
working with him, he said, it was like having a weird alien prodigy in your room. Oh, media G's out here. John Lennon's not black. My bad. <clears throat> Who was I thinking of there? <laughs> <laughs> the Friday night events at Largo were Brian's private playground. He conduct pop song chemistry experiments, building layered compositions from the ground up. According to a Chicago Tribune article titled, Who is John Bryan, and is there anything he can't do? He'd begin with a groove on drums, then shift to keyboards, then bass and guitar, all the while taping and looping each segment until a complete song appeared. Even covers could be inspired beyond belief. He'd take something like Captain and Tennille's Love Will Keep Us Together and fashion it lovingly, if not entirely, unironically, into something lush and surprising. As Flanagan recalled, word got around and it went from being a fun, casual thing to becoming an event. People started turning up to see who would get on stage with John, but after a while it turned out that they didn't care who would or wouldn't get up. They were just into him. Another novelty element was the armada of instruments he used night after night, either on his own or when sitting in with others. He picked them up at flea markets and garage sales, optagons, marks of phones, Chamberlain's old Wurlitzers bought for $50. Sometimes I keep broken stuff just because it makes this one great weird sound, and I'm not going to get rid of it until I can find a place where that one weird sound is going to have a happy home. Most of the stuff I do, he explained, is a coloring job. The hard part is finding human beings who know what they want to convey in a song. Unfortunately, there aren't that many people who have a real individualistic stance. Man, of course, was one such person. The two talked frequently and with militant intensity about the components of a truly good pop song. He had similar discussions with any number of intelligent, adventurous musicians out to undercut and challenge pop structures, including eventually Elliot. The two were introduced by Mary Lou Lord. At a gig she'd played, an old heat miser tune Brian had never heard before, the J.J. breakup number Half Right. I absolutely loved it, he said. He asked, does he have any other songs that are that good? All his songs are that good, Lord replied. This sent Brian on a mad hunt for old Elliot albums. As he listened, he flipped out. Within two songs, I was absolutely sold for life. At Lord's suggestion, Brian showed up at one of Elliot's gigs armed with a vibraphone and a chamberlain, saying, Hey, Mary Lou sent me down. He offered to sit in at soundcheck, playing as little or as much as Elliot desired. By this point, Brian knew Elliot's entire catalog, sometimes even better than Elliot did. If Elliot struggled to recall chords, Brian jumped in, and Elliot would look over at me in absolute shock. For Elliot, the attention must have been immensely flattering, a deep knowledge of his tunes in someone so gifted, along with a deep respect for what he was crafting. From that second on, Brian recalls, we were pretty much close. They would sit together after hours at the piano, working on or playing songs they both adored, like Elvis Costello's Blood and Chocolate or Saturday in the Park, or tunes from Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. For what may have been the first time, Elliot, to a degree that went far beyond previous partnerships and collaborations, found himself face-to-face -face with a genuine peer, someone who understood songcraft just as well as he did and who heard it in tunes and who heard in tunes the same magical changes in fact having studied it carefully brian became one of the most insightful interpreters of elliot's canon aware to an amazingly subtle degree of what set it apart so decisively from the sorts of things others were attempting we had never met anybody else who had harmonically heard things in the same way, Brian recalled. It was actually downright strange at times. If they happened to be listening to someone else's music, they'd shoot each other glances at the same moments. 
Much of it had to do with harmonic invention, the harmonic turn of phrase, which in Eliot's case was without peer, Brian believed. His chord changes, he said, the internal motion of the chords were always logical in a very beautiful way. He really loved the emotions that were generated by chord changes. He understood he understood it better than anyone I ever met, quite honestly, by a long shot. At the same time, Brian felt Elliot was no borrower. He had little interest in making his songs sound like older music he liked. What he was after was new beauty. An unmistakable modernity with natural motion. Some songs might sound Beatles-y, but they usually included changes that never happened on a Beatles record. That, Brian said, was one of his many copious gifts. On occasion, the motion was contrary, an anomalous harmony giving rise to feeling. Brian noticed even Stevie Wonder DNA in tunes like Independence Day, the way chords drifted down appealingly. Songs came together strangely at times, products of bizarre circumstance, not that it really mattered much. A song was a song. It worked or it didn't, regardless of how it materialized. Waltz number one is a case in point. Apparently, Elliot constructed its moody, eerie piano, overlaid with sleepy, sighing vocal harmonies, after listening for 18 hours straight, high on mushrooms, to the song Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Flanagan recalled him sitting and playing it on Brian's Casio, telling the story of how it came to be. Again, the waltz affection ran deep, ferrying feelings whose beginnings tracked back to the Texas years with Pickle, the difficulties with Charlie. As Elliot told Barney Hoskins in April 1998, For a while I made up nothing but waltzes, It was really weird. I wasn't planning on that. But everything was like 3-4. As Hoskins points it out, there was art on one hand and chaos on the other. You can't fall apart totally if what you want to do is create, he added. You have to be able to function. You can't just dive into the chaos. Elliot agreed in part, saying, Even with that, it's hard to represent chaos or an absence of something. It's much easier to represent the presence of something or a situation. People can be chaos, but it's hard to fit it into some creative piece. People try to do it over and over, and it's good that they do, but it's hard. Waltz number one was anything but chaos. It came from a chaotic space, an altered state of consciousness, but what it achieved as elusive, appositely ambiguous lyrics got added in was an august, chaos-defeating form, a magisterial beauty ill-befitting its origins. It was, in other words, art. Man, it... <laughs> well, why do I stutter? Because that sentence was so fucking dumb. You can tell it's me. Let's read that again to see how smart William Todd Schultz is and what you should not do in your biographies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to blame him, not me, by the way. Let's read this alliterative sentence. It came from a chaotic space, an altered state of consciousness, but what it achieved, as elusive, appositely ambiguous lyrics got added in, was an august, chaos-defeating form, a magisterial beauty ill-befitting its origins. I mean, was Schultz masturbating at the same time that he wrote that sentence? That's why he says it it was, in other words, art. I don't know, man. This is not, you're not writing your thesis, guys. Manifest Chaos would come for Elliot many years later when in 2000, and up to the last weeks of his life, he worked on the song for the album he never completed, From a Basement on the Hill. For now, he was in beauty mode. His inclination was to leave things pretty, not ugly them up with discordant soundscapes or experiments in sonic texture, as he put it to Hoskins in late April. OK, 
Okay, one more interjection here because this chapter has no end in sight, and this is usually where I like to end the videos. Um, and that sentence really bummed me out. <laughs> So this chapter goes on for quite a ways yet. I'm not sure I have the energy. I like to finish things, but I and I don't like putting chapters in two-part videos. What we go on to talk about here is the making of XO. Um, and the way that I'd previously done this video series is to do some editing. But this stuff is too interesting and important as we get into the late 90s. I'm not going to be editing this stuff. Um, this has been mostly a reading video, and um, though I get comments from you guys, hey, stop doing commentary, just read the book, my response is to go fuck yourself, these are my videos, I'll do whatever I want to do. That said, a lot of times commentary is not really needed. It's not really needed, except to say, hey, that's a dumb sentence, you're stupid. Um, but I, I find this very interesting kind of behind-the-scenes stuff as we get into Elliot's life. Uh, in the late 90s and how he's becoming more famous. Do you want to hear an hour and a half long video? Are you going to make it to the end, kids? Are you going to track with me? Okay, I'll give you a minute to decide. That's it. We're doing the hour and a half. You've earned it. I'm just going to pause, powder my nose, which means do a lot of cocaine. And uh, yeah, be right back. then well we're looking at more like a two hour video so at this point we're at the halfway mark not that what is this torture no 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 but you're a special person well listen if you like audiobooks with a little bit of personality in there then you're in the right place and i guess it's free so having said all that i don't ask for donations nor do i accept them what i do ask for is for you to stop right now and hit that like button and if you haven't already, subscribe to Southwest Studios, as I will strive to continue to bring you a variety of different content, including talking with Sam Weiss, doing movie reviews, finishing this audiobook, This Fall and Winter, Torment Saint by William Todd Schultz, and maybe going back to 2001, wrapping that up. And I get it, guys. I get very few views, and uh, go fuck yourself. Elliot's January Largo gig included Brian on several newer tunes, Waltz Numbers 1 and 2, Bottle Up and Explode, I Didn't Understand, also a cover of Walk Away Renee by The Left Bank. Alone, Elliot played Between the Bars, Bled White, and more. Miss Misery made its obligatory appearance, as did the guaranteed crowd-pleaser Say Yes. Less than one week later, the two covered the Beatles song Rain, a John Lennon B-side on the paperback writer single. The album Elliot would finish in mid-April, it was mastered and complete on April 29th, was to be called initially Grand Mall. Later that title was abandoned, a band by the name objected, and replaced by XO, a decision Elliot was marginally happy with, although he worried the phrase, its emotional connotation might be overly dramatic. A song, Grand Mall, was recorded with an opening similar to an earlier tune, Georgia, Georgia, but with the title going by the wayside, the song did too. A released version concludes with Elliot saying, forget it, now it's too fast. Frustration clearly present in his voice. Apparently, he could not get the tune into a shape he found acceptable. Many of the XO songs were written in 1997, during a portion of that year, Elliot called a bummer and a drag, referring to the cliff fall and the intervention that followed, plus his time shortened at Sierra Tucson. Friends felt XO was at least partly a response to those events, a sort of reaction, as one put it, to feeling really betrayed by a lot of people around him. The fact that the title suggests composed letters makes sense, each song its own missive, 
each targeting a different person or group, a collage of regrets, losses, and disappointments, sometimes pointedly delivered. Musically, it was a tried and true formula, with a camouflage of lyrics decipherable only by those in the know. Elliot expressed a rage he always disavowed if questioned directly. It was a way of having his cake and eating it too. Less autobiographically, the songs, as certain reviewers suggested, amounted to a Dylan-esque moment. With the increased potential for polish, the virtually unlimited number of tracks available, and the use of unexpected instrumentation brought in mainly by John Bryan, all of a sudden it seemed as if Elliot, like Dylan with like a rolling stone, was forsaking his roots. Lo-fi simplicity had seen its day never to reappear. The unhappily labeled folky was now a glittering pop star. Would he prosper in that role, the question seemed to be, or would the labeled jump undermine the focused, quiet complexity of the earlier, mostly homemade recordings? These apprehensions proved short-lived and in some ways fatuous. What happened was what always seemed to happen with Elliot. The new album was better than anything that had come before. Improbably, he kept improving on what had seemed unimprovable, his art a linear, incremental triumph. As a group, the songs were more rock, he reflected, but they just turned out that way. They didn't have to be rock songs. But then, as always, the notion of preset categories, shorthand ways of saying nothing, held no interest. Folk, he called a ghetto of rampant sentimentality. He knew that wasn't him from the moment he began recording in Texas. Nor was anything else, really. The less I think about how I fit in, the happier I am he told Triple J in a 1998 interview. I don't really care where I fit into anything or if there's anything to fit into. It's just that I like music. It's not complicated. And in most ways, it wasn't. What emerged was more of the same. The record recycled old and seemingly irrepressible lyrical themes, the ones at the center of all Elliot's work because they were at the center of his emotional life. Love and hate battle each other as Eliot imagines, burning history backward in the first song, Sweet Adeline, a nod to his mother's musical side of the family, his grandmother in particular, and her Sweet Adeline choral group. In Pizzola, the devil drives him to give up the thing he loves. Here that thing is J.J. Gonson. In I Didn't Understand, he admits, there's nothing here that you'll miss, comparing himself to a cloud of smoke. Waltz number one circles the same dynamic, the same repetition. Because he never leaves his zone, he goes home alone, wishing he'd never seen the girl's face. Amity takes the formula to its extreme. God made him junk, and he's ready not to love, but to go, by which he meant stop living. The album's second song, The Breathtaking, Tomorrow, Tomorrow, spells out in the very first line Eliot's own eternal return, as Nietzsche once called it. Everybody knows which way you go, straight to over. Trauma gives rise to fixed, petrified sentiments that repeat compulsively to no emotional benefit. The past-focused songs keep predicting the same bleak future to the point where sedation alone being fully loaded, stands any chance of disconnecting his head. He says twice in the first two songs that he's deaf and dumb and done. He's heard the hammer at the lock, and there's no way out of the space he's in. Or there is potentially, but when he tries following the reflected sound of everything, the noise coming out unstoppably, the music in other words, even if it even it does not lead to anything. He hears it, he makes it, but by doing so, he is no less done. Once again, the content of the songs makes for anything but an antidepressant. Yet just the same and just as before and always, the songs are undeniably, inexpressibly beautiful. 
practically Kafkaesque in their Baroque suffering. The most attacking songs, the ones aimed at sanctimony and self-righteousness, at people who seem to think they know what he needs, he groups together toward the end of the record. In a question mark, he gives back hatred to the world that treated him badly, sickened by all the people who seem to know what's up. Mockingly, he repeats the words, you know, nine times, as if to call out all the people who tried setting him straight, who imposed their judgments on his life. The target is the delusion of misguided helpers. He tells them they can give him a call if they ever want to say sorry. But it's with everybody cares, everybody understands, that Elliot really bears down scathingly. This is the remade tune going back to college years, the one first recorded by Harum Scarum in 1989 for the cassette Trick of the Paris Season. Musically, it is relatively unchanged in basic structure, but Elliot wrote new lyrics reflecting current thoughts and feelings. He first performed the reshaped version just around the start of the, of the year, in January 1998, with the intervention still fresh. Here, understanding amounts to a kick in the head. It's fake, a quiet lie. It makes him want to scream and shout, but instead he lies dreaming. He retreats to the solitude of private inner experience, just as he does too in a question mark. There are two responses available, it seems. Fury or isolation. Either satisfies but the longer-term solution, the one he kept resorting to, was isolation. People think they mean well, he sings. They say they care. They say they sympathize. They say they want the best for him. But it is all bullshit. Fucking ought to stay the hell away from things you know nothing about. He snarls at the song's end. It's clear from the start something heavy is up. Elliot strums a single chord over and over, an ominous tolling of dark sentiment. At its close, the song erupts with an unexpected smart piano and layered instrumentation as it builds to a climbing crescendo with John Bryan on Chamberlain and vibraphone. It's yet another example of Elliot expertly crafting a tune, as simple guitar chords give way in the end to a musical cacophony recalling Lennon's A Day in the Life. The song setting these two tunes up is older, first performed in spring of 1996. Bottle Up and Explode is one of the several firecracker tunes, a cousin of sorts to Roman Candle. It's an expression of dual identity. The troublemaker, a buried second self, proliferates below, gathering strength. Although he's always been aware of his presence, Elliot looks at him like he's unrecognizable. But he's coming through anyway. He can make it outside. I'll get through, he warns, becoming you. It is a canny song ordering. The bottled up devil inside explodes, followed by a question mark. And everybody cares, everybody understands the songs written in the devil's voice. But the fire and brimstone is only part of the record, its own compartmentalized closet of rage. Baby Britain is a sublime pop confection with a slight nod to the Beatles getting better about drinking with a girl who floats over a sea of vodka. The Beatles even get an explicit mention as the two listen to Revolver. A minor theme in the record is drink, and everyone seems to be getting hammered. Bled White has Elliot wasted in order to take away the curse, although all it does is make him feel worse. Sweet Adeline extols the feeling of sedation already mentioned. Happiness arrived only when the bottle's broken, it appears. And although it's hard to imagine any real solution, Elliot still musters a kind of half-baked hopefulness, deciding, at the end of Bled White, I'm not fucked, not quite. Then there's Independence Day, one of Elliot's most hopeful songs by far about a future butterfly, biding his time until finally he soars brilliantly. The temptation is to connect the tune to Elliot, to see it as a moment of positive feeling. 
In fact, it was written about his New York friend, Josh. Dorian Gary is certainly of this. Excuse me. Dorian Gary is certain of this, since it was one of the few occasions Elliot told her explicitly what a song was about. He mentioned the same connection in an interview as well, calling the song optimistic, its message being, you have everything you need to be happy, but you've just got to wait a bit. Gary knew Josh and had introduced him to Elliot. The two became close during the roving East Coast year. Finding the good in others was always a lot easier than finding it in himself, although it was there, of course, just constantly getting snuffed out. The record's crowning moment, Elliot's crowning moment, in fact. The record's crowning moment, Elliot's crowning moment, in fact, comes with song number three. Waltz number two, XO, the album's single, is a pop masterpiece from inception to close, cited even by one of Elliot's heroes, Elvis Costello. The song went through a number of iterations as Elliot out of fear of what it might reveal, revised to disguise. The opening is inexpressibly ominous, a perfect distillation of dark intent, creating a mood of foreboding as drums give way to repeated guitar chords much like those in Everybody Cares. Guitar then... Guitar lead then tracks a melody down as piano comes in to duplicate the same run. There's a momentary pause, followed by a skipped drum beat, and the first verse begins. In a weird way, the song sounds like nothing else in Elliot's corpus of work. It is a strange singularity. Everything led up to it, but nothing resembles it. It's utterly sui generis. The basic plot was described earlier. The setting is a karaoke bar, like the ones Elliot frequented in Portland, such as Chopsticks Express on East Burnside. Bunny sings a tune, as does Charlie. Her song, Kathy's Clown, calls Charlie out. His You're No Good summarizes his feelings about Elliot as a young man. As for Bunny, there is ambivalence. She blunts her feelings, she pretends she does not see, and he actually reassures her, saying, It's all right, nothing's wrong. Although occasionally in live performances, he replaced that line with It's all right, it's all wrong. His final conclusion is simple and heartbreaking. He'll never really know her now. He's left Texas behind for Portland. But all the same, he's going to love her always. The record was released August 25th, 1998, with a collage cover of splashed black and white Polaroids and two oblique shots of Elliot crouched over it with eyes closed in one and tuning a guitar in the other. As usual, Elliot is not the cover's focus. His name appears at the bottom, but to make out the two images of him takes some doing. Spin noted the sweetly inescapable catchiness of the tune, which hung around in your head like stray dogs shown kindness for the first time. Not self-pitying, not raging against the pain, in the suspect words of the spin reviewer, Elliot is just sad and he understands his ache to make it sweet. Others noted the increased amount of sounds at Elliot's disposal, finding these to be a welcome expansion of a, what sometimes been a samey blandness. To Sputnik Music, Elliot's imagery and illusions were beyond comparison, and though he is said to speak of suicide in an almost prophetic way, XO seems like the perfect record, almost too perfect. The BBC observed an expert maintenance of atmosphere. The lyrics, they say, depict clear emotional unrest, and despite the fact that Situations get the better of Smith, resolution rarely presents itself. Treble Zine called the lyrics heartbreakingly tender and true. When the dust cleared many years later after Elliot's death, Spin placed XO at number 90 on their list of best albums of the last 25 years, 
This was in February 2012. Pitchfork at number 23 of records from the 1990s. One of the more madcap and apparently enormously enjoyable offshoots of XO was Strange Parallel, a roughly 20-minute bizarro film made with Elliot by Steve Hanft, an independent film director responsible for Beck's hilarious Loser video filmed on a $300 budget. In one short, in one shortcut, the cinephile filmmaker chain smokes in a darkened theater, observing in a French accent something along the lines of, this has style, but no continuity. Can I just point out how annoying that is that I finally get to do an accent, a French accent too, and then the, my battery warning's got to go off, and then it's got to be loud and disturb me and you, and I finally get to do an accent, which is the only reason I wake up in the morning, is to hopefully do a French accent. That was going to be the greatest moment of my day, probably week. It might even have started off November in a very lucky way. And instead, we're fucking cursed. Cursed by the low battery. It's all right. Drink your coffee. We all needed a break, and I don't want to hear your shit. This should be the tagline in my show. I don't want to hear your fucking bullshit. <laughs> Where are we? It's an adroit description, a sort of built-in getting ahead of the story. As a kid, Hanft had commandeered three records from his parents that he wore out listening to. Yellow Submarine, The Monkey's Greatest Hits, and Dylan's John Wesley Harding. He went through a hardcore Devo phase, then all of a sudden I was punk. He sport, He sported spiky hair and started turning up at Black Flag and Bad Brain shows. Yet, like Elliot, his tastes were democratic. He liked George Jones, Fleetwood Mac, Leonard Cohen, and the Velvet Underground, too. As he said by way of summarizing, I can't like music that is overproduced in a crummy way or has no spirit. Hanft also played in bands, one with Beck called Loser, before the Loser single appeared. Later, the band name was changed to Liquor Cabinet. His stage persona amounted to screaming a lot in the mic, wearing only underwear and a stupid wig. Elliot came to some of these shows. His typical request was for a tune called Beeper City. As for filmmaking, Hanf was always drawn, he explained, to losers who are original. He did not know exactly why, except for the fact that I love them. Fuck yeah. Yes, losers who are original. The film begins with Elliot scurrying across a road comically in order to exhume a guitar buried in the woods. A film crew of two keep wandering around Portland asking, Have you seen Elliot Smith? It's established that no one knows where he is. He's the archetypical nomadic free spirit. It is our fourth day here, they add, and although they keep checking out different bars in the hope of meeting up with Elliot, he keeps giving us almost the right address, they realize. Freeing the guitar from its underground hole, Elliot then sits and sings Waltz Number 2, XO. At different points, a bartender enters the narrative to say things like, Elliot is a real gentleman, or he's really quiet, or he's a lovely person. In fact, it is this bartender who provides the film's title. He notes a strange parallel with Elliot in that he too is a writer, and what Elliot did in the bar was right. One scene features Miss Misery lyrics sitting face up on the bar as a toy robot shoots fire at them. It seems to be an acerbic comment on fame and on the tiresomeness of the song in the wake of the Oscars. In a very nice touch, Elliot lights a cigarette on the robot flame. Scenes drop in desultorily. Dis fuck. <laughs> this fucking asshole would stop using words that are just uh, 
I don't know. It's what your annoying high school girlfriend would write in AP English. Words that no one uses, but they're just flower words. Scenes drop in desultorily, creating a collage effect to mirror, most likely accidentally, the XO cover. Elliot is shown recording Brand New Game. He's filmed as an interviewer queries him inaccurately about performing at the Grammys. He's shown smoking with Joanna Baum in the Rome 2 in a white lab jacket. Larry Crane of Jackpot Recording, with whom Elliot recorded Baby Britain and Amity, which in its original version included Cre- Pete Krebs on Vokes, is heard to say, It's hard to find Elliot. But then the plot finds itself as Elliot sits in a hotel room watching a ridiculous Spanish infomercial for a mechanical hand. It promises to expand your guitar virtuosity immediately for three payments of $5,999. Elliot buys one from a guy on the street calling out, Get your robot hand! Robot hand is the future! This is followed by a cut to a boardroom in which a man in a suit and headphones who's been lurking throughout the film urges Elliot, along with several others, to get the robot hand. He's actually already gotten it, so the scene is a little nonsensical. The absurd demands from the suit in the meeting pokes still more fun at the industry side of things, it seems clear. Elliot plays a small section of the gorgeous George Harrison tune, Isn't It a Pity, then says with hilarious deadpan, I think the music business will eventually crush me, but I'm ready. Things wind down goofily with a shot of Quasi, Sam Coons in a skeleton outfit, Janet Weiss dressed as Cleopatra, sitting in a backyard talking about Elliot's dark lyricism. Elliot then has a good old daydream on a plane, which leads to a blood-spattered scene of his arm being hacksawed off by a Jamaican surgeon, then later tossed on a bar where Sean Krogan appears as a drill sergeant screaming at Elliot, I can't help you till you admit you have a problem. A loaded statement if there ever was one under the circumstances. And you have to admit your future is uncertain. Toward the end, Elliot plays ZZ Top, followed by Rachmaninoff. The filmmaker intones, even though we worked on the film for a few months, Elliot was still a mystery to us. He lends a hand to all the lovely ones. A robot hand, as it were, but still a hand, broadly speaking. Constituting anything but mainstream MTV-type fare, and with its length, hardly a commercially viable vehicle for positioning Elliot as a tender, sensitive artist-type a la Miss Misery. The film illustrates both Elliot's willingness to make light of his persona, as well as his artistically experimental mindset, how he wanted to the very end to leapfrog convention, usually sardonically. It also speaks well of DreamWorks for that matter since they officially produced it. There was no music video made for the record's single, Waltz No. 2, XO, but there was for Baby Britain, also directed by Hanft. It recycles shots of Elliot in the robot hand, but focuses on him in the studio with Balm. For several years, the relationship was on again, off again, as he plays every instrument in sight. A few live shots also get thrown in, too, with Quasi's Janet Weiss on drums. Bohm's presence is especially effectively conveyed. It is always in passing. The camera never lingers on her, nor does it linger much at all throughout. But it's clear somehow that she and Elliot are exceptionally close. She keeps popping up in the studio, hovering lovingly and supportively. Although it does not present itself in this way at all, the video comes across as a sort of love poem. By October 17th, it was back, forcefully, to the big time, as Elliot played Waltz 2 XO on Saturday Night Live. That Xena's Lucy Lawless hosted makes for an amusing serendipity, given Elliot's Xena love, at least with the sound off. Rumor has it that producers asked him to play Miss Misery, an idea he rejected. John Bryan, it turns out, was part of the backing band that night. 
as he had been on the record version of the tune. Then it was off to Europe in the first part of November, Elliot playing Brussels, Paris, Norway, London, then returning to Seattle for the Deck the Hall Ball on December 9th, 1998, an event also featuring Courtney Love's and Eric Erlinson's band Hole. Newer tunes kept entering a set list. Stupidity Tries, the clever Oscars bash, and Ballad of Big Nothing. Two cover tunes made consistent appearances, too. Thirteen, already featured in Jem Cohen's film Lucky Three, was a sweet big star number written by Alex Chilton after watching a Beatles performance. His band was British Invasion-inspired, influenced heavily by the Beatles and the Kinks, just like Elliot was. Rolling Stone called 13 one of rock's most beautiful celebrations of adolescence. Elliot's recorded version was later used posthumously in the 2005 film Thumbsucker. Another cover, George Harrison's Give Me Love, Give Me Peace on Earth, often closed this set of shows. Friends and fans alike often debated which Beatle Elliot most resembled musically. Melodically, it is easy to see the McCartney influence in songs like Baby Britain, and Elliot sometimes stood up for Paul when others bashed his brainless poppiness. Elliot clearly adored Lennon. He covered Jealous Guy regularly during 1998, and some suggest A Day in the Life was his all-time favorite Beatles tune. Harrison is sometimes left out of these comparisons, although he shouldn't be. In some ways, Elliot's songs are unmistakably Harrison-esque with their jangly, swirling atmospheres, their way of sounding slightly off, slightly disarming, while also listenable. Years later, according to Elliot's friend Nelson Gary, Elliot even started intentionally looking like George Harrison circa All Things Must Pass, growing his hair longer, dressing like a hobo hippie. The merciless touring, the interviews, the grinding fame shot. Elliot seemed to handle it all passably well. It's not as if he collapsed in a pool of panic at the Oscars. As he said so many times, to the point, in fact, where the remark began to sound suspicious, the night was too bizarre for any real nervousness. Antidepressants might have helped to take the edge off, although in the long run they never seemed like a workable solution. No doubt his confidence was growing, the accolades shoring up feelings of self-assurance. He was very good, the world kept telling him, and even if large parts of him doubted that proclamation, some portion of the message must have started to snake through to alter his always shaky self-perceptions. Still, he was strapped... Still, he grappled with guilt. He told himself, What I do is no better than anyone else. So why this success and why for me? He was embarrassed signing autographs, being recognized. He made music because it was in him not to please anyone. The latter was a constantly surprising side effect. There were stomach problems brought on by nerves or drinking or the combination of the two. He'd sometimes stop in the middle of performances to use the bathroom. But the wheels were in motion. Fame had him spinning, holding on to the wheel for dear life. He loved hair-raising carnival rides, the ones no one else dared trying, and fame was like a, and fame was a scrambler like no other. Yet as 1998 faded into 1999, the XO touring chewed him up to the point where he got sick of playing his own songs. In March, for instance, as he worked his way from the Fillmore in San Francisco to L.A., New Orleans, Austin, Orlando, Nashville, New York, and Boston, he had exactly six nights off. In April, it was much the same, roughly ten nights off with a second trip to Europe beginning on April 17th. A gig at the trees in the Deep Ellum area of Dallas on March 9th, 1999, was an especially interesting evening. Pickle got word of the performance, 
not from Elliot. The two had long ago fallen out of touch. He'd been tracking Elliot's success with a mix of pride and amazement. That night, he, Denbo, Mark Merritt, Elliot's old girlfriend Kim, and Denbo's younger brother Kyle all took in the show, as did Zot, the older girl Elliot once made out with in the back of the high school band bus. <clears throat> Kim screwed up the nerve to ask a security guard to deliver a message to Elliot backstage, and he invited them all in. A picture shows Elliot in an 88 t-shirt surrounded by his Cedar Hill bandmates, Kim blonde to his right in a fetching red dress. Yet another friend on hand, Mark Pittman, recalled the night. Whoa. All of us who knew him back all of us who knew him back when we were beaming uncontrollably, probably looking like idiots to the man on stage. Kevin Denbo was standing next to me, a few feet from the front of the stage, enthusiastically singing every word to every song back at Elliot. Pickle says Elliot spoke to all of us for about an hour, which is very nice. He was gracious, kind, open to reminiscing a bit about the better parts of his Texas years, including the time he beat Pittman in a talent contest by playing an 8th grade love song. Pittman suggested he should have won. Elliot happily agreed with him. All the same, to Pickle, Elliot appeared socially ill at ease. He didn't seem comfortable. Most likely because the very idea of Texas always left him worked up. By this time, Pickle observed, Elliot had fully adopted this thing, a permanent part of his personality later in life. When he didn't want to talk about something, he'd just stop and evaporate. Whatever the case, it was a thrilling evening for the old gang. One of them... The person they'd sung with on Outward Bound, jammed with on Inspector Detector, rocked out with on Carry On Wayward Son, and Stairway to Heaven, had made it big. It was impossible, but it was true. And they had been there when it all began. Their Steve Smith was now Elliot, a bona fide star in the making. The 800 or so kids in piercings and unnaturally dyed hair merely fantasized closeness to the shy guy on stage. Pickle and the others knew him. He was their friend. That night, he proved what they always suspected, that Elliot was different, that for him, the sky was the limit. Okay. Quite a dramatic book slam at the end. Remind me, 133.02, take that level down. That's rude, but it's dramatic. Why is that so loud? Okay, so I don't really have much comment. This was a reading day. It's been fun for me. Um, now I was confused as to who Pickle was. Um, I just read the stuff. I am making sense of it. I do know what's important, but you have to understand there's a lot of things going on in your brain when you're trying to read and do this and that and you're just waiting for a French accent part. As I said, uh, that's what I'm in it for. Okay. Um, what this does remind me, so I thought for a second Charlie was going to be there, you know, but maybe we'll get more into that and kind of that family reunion. I did find the stuff about Elliot and his sister touching. She is in that documentary, Heaven Adores You. And uh, it reminds me, you know, there are so many parallels here to Kurt Cobain and the relationship with his sister. And to me, it just makes me think of, you got to go home. Who is home in your life? You know, family is great if you have that person that loves you and never judges you. Um, Hopefully, we all have someone like that in our life who is home that can set us straight, no matter how big we get or little we get in the eyes of accomplishments and society and these kinds of things. Our friends and family are there to bring us down to earth. And what does that mean? Sometimes that means just loving us unconditionally or doing what we need when we need help. So this has been fun. And I thought this was going to go to like two hours and it didn't. 
I don't really have anything to say here. We're just watching Elliot's star rise. He's not really into drugs yet. Okay, it's going to get a lot more dramatic as we continue to go along this fall and winter. And I don't mean that in any kind of salacious way. We all know what happened here. Elliot dying in October of 2003 by suicide. <clears throat> and yes, I do believe that. Um, I'm not interested in this as a conspiracy theory because it isn't. You know. I mean, it is strange the way he chose to stab himself twice in the chest and I think it just speaks to a very unhealthy mental and emotional state due to withdrawal at that time but we will certainly get there towards the end of this book so for now I want to ask you to like and subscribe and thanks for listening this has been Media Gitao saying have a great day